Hi, I'm Don Wilcox. I'm a postdoc here in the Center for Computational Sciences and Engineering. And I'm very glad to talk to you today about work that I've been doing to build a scalable simulation code for modeling neutrino quantum kinetics in astrophysics. Um, and, and this has important implications for nuclear astrophysics events like core collapse supernova and neutron star mergers. Core collapse supernovae are the endpoints of stellar evolution for massive stars where they can no longer support themselves by nuclear fusion. The core collapses to form a proto-neutron star that, being very dense, rebounds any infalling material and launches an outgoing shock. The outgoing shock is then further powered by a neutrino wind uh, to, to explode the star. A ne neutron star mergers are, are really exciting events. They um, they are the in spiral and merger of a binary neutron star system that has lost orbital energy due to gravitational wave emission. Um, in 2017, the first gravitational wave and electromagnetic observations uh, were published by the LIGO and Virgo collaborations showing uh, the gravitational wave strain frequency from a binary neutron star merger simulation uh, growing in a characteristic chirp from lower frequencies rapidly increasing to high frequencies uh, as within the, the 30 seconds leading up to a neutron star merger. Um, one of the things that makes neutron star mergers so important is that um, they are a significant site of nucleosynthesis for heavy elements, um, heavy elements I including gold and platinum and um, and, and other very massive uh, neutron-rich elements. Uh, neutrinos play an important role here in setting properties of nucleosynthesis for, for mergers. And to understand the role of neutrinos, we're going to, to set a little bit of background here. Neutrinos are very light, spin one half, electrically neutral fundamental particles that interact via the weak nuclear force. Um, they're created in neutron star mergers from the very, a very hot equatorial disk surrounding the, the central uh, merged object, either a black hole or a, um, or a, a, or a short-lived hypermassive neutron star. Um, and this, this very hot disk surrounding the, the, the central object after the merger um, cools via emitting neutrinos uh, with characteristic energies of 10 MeV. The important thing is that at these energies, um, neutrinos can and antineutrinos can create electrons or positrons, but not muon or tau leptons, uh, since those are energetically disfavored. Those uh, those energies are much higher than 10 MeV. Um, now, neutrinos come uh, can come in three different flavor states that correspond to interactions with electrons, muon or tau leptons. Because muons and tau leptons are energetically disfavored, the dynamical neutrinos of interest are neutrinos with a pure electron flavor state. Neutrinos and antineutrinos with a pure electron flavor state can interchange neutrons and protons. And this sets how many neutrons and protons can participate in nucleosynthesis. The really important thing to point out here is that flavor for neutrinos is not an immutable property like mass or charge for electrons. Um, neutrinos are really created in, uh, in flavor states corresponding to electrons, muons, or taus, but they change their flavor state in flight. And in neutron star mergers or core collapse supernova environments, certain conditions can cause very fast flavor instabilities to rapidly change electron, uh, rapidly change electron flavor state for neutrinos into into a combination of electron, muon, and tau flavors on picosecond to nanosecond timescales. This has important consequences for nucleosynthesis in neutron star mergers. Um, the left-hand side is a snapshot of a neutrino transport um, sim component of a neutron star merger simulation, where we see a central black hole, an equatorial disk that emits neutrinos and antineutrinos, and then a surrounding material that's, out, that's flowing outward. Red indicates regions um, where the electron fraction is decreasing with time, that is, material is becoming more neutron-rich. Blue indicates regions that it is becoming more proton-rich relative to neutrons. And so what we see is that 
electron neutrino interactions drive changes in the outflow composition. Now, what happens if neutrinos undergo a fast flavor instability? To answer that question, let's look at the plot on the right where folks post-processed a neutron star merger simulation and um, instead of resolving picosecond to nanosecond flavor changes, they made a very simple assumption that the presence of any neutrino fast flavor instability would evenly distribute neutrino flavor um, into all three neutrino states. And so this effectively reduces the fraction of neutrinos in a pure electron flavor state by a factor of a third. The consequence is to make the ejecta much more neutron rich and there, thus produce uh, many more uh, heavy elements between mass number 100 and 200 by a factor of 100 or 1,000. And so um, what we're going to see is that flavor is a part of the um, neutrino quantum state where neutrino flavor evolves uh, as either a pure or as a pure or a mixed state. It evolves in vacuum or due to interactions with matter and other neutrinos. And we represent neutrino flavor state as a 3 by 3 Hermitian density matrix. Now, the diagonal components of this density matrix uh, encode the occupation probabilities for the neutrinos to, to have flavor electron, muon, or tau flavors. The complex off-diagonals uh, encode the quantum coherence between flavor states. And that's the, the central quantity that we're going to evolve. Now, there are far too many neutrinos for us to track them individually, so we're going to introduce a mean field approximation that lets us construct a distribution function for neutrino flavor. And the way we do this is to consider a point uh, X and a momentum P in uh, neutrino phase space, where um, we note that there are capital N new neutrinos in a differential volume element that in space and in momentum surrounding this point. We are going to represent the, this number of physical neutrinos by a single computational particle with a density matrix that encodes the, the average density matrix for these physical neutrinos in this phase space volume element. We're going to do exactly the same thing for antineutrinos. And we can then consider the quantum kinetic equation shown here at the top for the evolution of this distribution function for neutrino flavor. The left-hand side is simply advective transport uh, of the neutrino distribution in uh, direction omega at velocity c for ultra-relativistic neutrinos. Um, the, the red term here is a collision integral that incorporates scattering. Scattering occurs on 10 to the 6 times longer scales than the fast flavor instability we're interested in, so we're going to neglect this term. And then the final term here in purple is the quantum flavor state evolution uh, for the distribution. And this is a, a matrix commutator between the Hamiltonian for neutrino flavor and the distribution function. Um, what we're going to see is that to solve this, this mean field quantum kinetic equation, we can leverage particle and cell methods um, very analogously to plasma physics. And so um, the, the, the motivation for this uh, comes from the structure of the Hamiltonian. So we're just going to, to briefly point out here that this Hamiltonian involves a matter term and a neutrino term. The matter term represents interactions with uh, neutrinos and charged leptons that drive flavor changes. It de depends on number densities of electrons and muons and taus, and number of flux densities for those charged leptons at the, neutri at the uh, neutrino position for a computational particle. The neutrino component to the Hamiltonian, for that we need the local uh, neutrino density and flux density. Um, and so these densities and flux densities are local integrals of the distribution function at the particle locations. And we can efficiently evaluate the, these local integrals using a particle and cell method. The way this works is we set up a spatial grid uh, here as shown in the center, um, where at each cell we initialize a distribution of computational particles 
uh, isotropic in direction, and we encode an arbitrary distribution uh, by setting the, the weights n and n bar for the number of physical neutrinos and antineutrinos our computational particles represent, and we can set their density matrices. So the system of equations that we evolve for each computational particle are shown here on the left. Um, and the first three terms here are the ones we evolve. Position for each computational particle, they move in a straight line at velocity c. And then we have a, a, um, a density matrix that describes the, the flavor state of neutrinos mm -hmm. and a density matrix that describes the flavor state of antineutrinos. The important thing here is that we need the Hamiltonian um, at the particle position. And so we're going to see how to get that. We integrate that system of equations for all particles using a fourth order explicit Runge-Kutta integrator, where we evaluate the particle right-hand side using a sequence of particle mesh operations. As shown in this schematic, we start out with these green arrows where we take our computational particles and we deposit them onto underlying grids, where black cells denote valid cells in the grid interiors, white, cell, white circles represent uh, ghost cells. And this allows us to get number density and number flux density on the mesh. We then uh, move to these, these blue arrows, which represent communication operations where we sum ghost cells we've deposited into into their corresponding valid cells. And then we fill ghost cells by copying from the uh, newly updated valid cells. This prepares us for the the step shown by purple arrows, where we interpolate number density and number flux density of neutrinos from the grid back to the particles. Now that we have um, the number density and fluxes at particle locations, we can construct Hamiltonians for each particle and then evaluate the right-hand side for the density matrix of each particle for neutrinos and antineutrinos. Um, these are standard particle and cell um, deposition and interpolation operations that use uh, where we're using second order uh, spline shape functions. Now um, we implement this algorithm in a new code EMU, which is a particle and cell neutrino quantum kinetics code based on AMRX. And to to build EMU, we express all of the all of the math for the Hamiltonians and the density matrix evolution. We express all of that symbolically using SymPy and then generate C++ code with SymPy for, um, for our computational kernels. We build this on top of AMRX for the particle mesh algorithms. AMRX is a uh, block structured adaptive mesh refinement code um, that includes uh, support for particle mesh operations and linear solvers and, and much more. What we're going to leverage for EMU, e what we leverage for EMU is uh, domain distributed grid and particle data, where the domain is composed of a union of non-overlapping grids distributed across MPI ranks as shown to the right with uh, different colored uh, grids b belonging on different MPI ranks. AMREX provides high level abstractions for MPI communication between grids, as well as performance portable mesh and particle kernels for CPUs and GPUs. And what this enables is for us to simulate neutrino flavor uh, directly using large-scale supercomputing as on uh, the Summit supercomputer at OLCF based on GPUs. Here we're looking at weak scaling for EMU where we're measuring a figure of merit that is number of particles uh, time stepped per microsecond of wall time as a function of the number of uh, nodes on Summit we're using going up to a weak scaling up to a 1024 cubed uh, domain where uh, we can run on 683 nodes with a bit over 4,000 GPUs. Uh, ideal scaling is shown in green here, and we don't quite reach ideal scaling. The reason is that we have um, three synchronous communication steps in each time step. We have to sum ghost cells into valid cells, copy valid cells back to ghost cells, and then redistribute particles to new grids as they move. Um, and, and that's unavoidable, but we can, but we can show that we, um, we can effectively use thousands of GPUs um, for large-scale simulations. So um, to validate EMU, we are uh, first going to do, we were first going, we first do one-dimensional simulations. This, is, uh, this, is, this comprises um, 
our first science paper that, that we've recently submitted. And um, so we're going to do 1D simulations in space uh, with multi-angle and neutrino directions. Uh, on the left, at time zero, we initialize the neutrino distribution to be in a pure electron flavor state with opposing neutrino and anti-neutrino fluxes to trigger the fast flavor instability. And what we see is that within 0.27 nanoseconds, this fast flavor instability grows rapidly. We convert lots of neutrinos from an electron flavor state into mu and tau flavor states, shown in red and, and yellow. And um, after about 0.3 nanoseconds, this instability saturates the nonlinear, the nonlinear terms in the um, quantum kinetics equation take over, and we get a, a chaotic uh, coupling of modes um, that equilibrates flavor around a constant value, in this case, a value of one third. On the right, we see um, the quantum coherence between neutrino flavor states uh, that similarly becomes chaotic uh, after the linear instability grows. Um, we confirm uh, EMU's results by uh, computing the growth rates for our sim from our simulations, um, and we we match these with um, theoretical predictions from the uh, dispersion relation um, predictions for the exponential growth rates. Um, so with that confirmation, we move on to a parameter study where we look at the number of electron neutrinos. Um, the anti-neutrino flux, the relative orientations of neutrino and anti-neutrino flux, and the, the ratio of anti-neutrinos to neutrinos. And, um, and there's a lot here, so I'm going to just uh, point out the highlights. What we find is that the instability timescale and the post-saturation equilibrium after the instability are very sensitive to anti-neutrino flux, to relative neutrino and anti-neutrino directions, and to relative neutrino and anti-neutrino densities. We find that flavor transformation is limited by the minimum of neutrino and anti-neutrino abundances in, in this, uh, the points to the right in black. Um, and we find that um, there's an essential condition that the, the flux distributions of electron neutrinos and anti-neutrinos anti must cross in order to, to make the flavor instability possible. The most important finding here is that the equilibrium state is not consistently uh, an equal partition of one third. Um, so um, this really requires one to directly simulate the fast flavor instability to determine its effects on neutron star mergers or core collapse supernovae. Um, we also look at convergence, um, where we where we converge in grid zones, domain size angular resolution, and really our finding here is that in order to get good convergence, you have to simultaneously converge in domain size, grid resolution, and angular resolution. Um, we have also begun simulating the fast flavor instability in three dimensions, um, and shown here is, a, is an animation where the diagonal represents occupation probabilities for 2D slices in a 3D domain. Off diagonals here, are the, the uh, quantum coherence terms between flavors. Upper off diagonals are magnitudes, lower off diagonals are complex phases. And again, we see that an initially pure electron flavor state uh, quickly transitions to a, uh, a mixture of electron muon and tau flavor states. And, um, and after saturation, all the structures on very fine scale uh, fluctuations around an equilibrium value. Um, so, with this, uh, so with this, we have uh, we have developed a particle and cell method. Uh, we have implemented it in the code EMU, and made it a tool for doing exciting new neutrino science. EMU is the first HPC simulation code for doing neutrino quantum kinetics with three flavors in full three dimensions with arbitrary angular resolution. And this is really exciting because we have new science directions um, now open to us. We can do flavor simulations in two D and three D space. We can do parameter sweeps. Um, we can introduce realistic matter backgrounds from neutron star mergers and core collapse supernovae, quantify fundamental physics uncertainties in, um, in the fast flavor instability, and then ultimately develop subgrid scale models to incorporate back into large scale neutron star merger and core collapse supernova simulations. 
So with that, I want to, I want to take a moment to, um, to express my, my deep appreciation for the collaborators that made this, this work possible. Um, Sherwood Richards, a postdoc at UC Berkeley and uh, LBL of Nuclear Science Division affiliate, who has done uh, a lot of work on neutrino flavor transformations and um, who it, 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 I've really enjoyed learning from as we develop this code. Uh, Nicole Ford, um, who is with us through a DOE science undergraduate laboratory internship um, and uh, through last spring or last fall and this spring. And um, Andrew Myers, a CCSE staff who uh, develops the particle infrastructure inside AMRX and who uh, has been an, an invaluable resource for explaining how the AMRX particle infrastructure works and uh, recommending performance improvements. Um, so with that, uh, we've touched on a lot of topics, so if you want to follow up, please feel free to contact us to, if you want to talk further about the EMU code or the neutrino science. Um, we'd be very happy to, to talk with you, and, uh, and I look forward to talking with you in the, the question and answer session coming up. Thank you again.